Welcome to A Brew with Shoe, a virtual beer tasting series to support the Connecticut Brewers Guild African American Brewing Scholarship at Sacred Heart University. Join us now live from one of Connecticut's favorite local breweries, New England Brewing Company in Woodbridge, Connecticut, with your host, 2006 Shoe alumnus, Mike Johnson. My name is Mike Johnson and I'm alumnus of Sacred Heart University from 2006. I uh, really appreciate everyone's first contributions to the Brewery Science Program, uh, which is what made all of this happen. We've raised thousands of dollars and uh, promoted a lot of great products, thanks to NEPCO for their generosity as well for donating that product. I've got three gentlemen to my right that are socially distanced by beer barrels in an amazing studio that would rival anything you could find. Uh, so to my right, I have Greg Radowich, who's uh, the person that's going to be the beer sommelier for us as you open your cans for the first time. And directly to Greg's right, we have Jamal Robinson, who's going to be talking a lot more about the scholarship program uh, that's benefiting tonight's uh, fundraiser and series of fundraisers. And he's also director of sales at NEPCO, so he's going to share a little bit more light on that as well. And directly to Jamal's right, we have Jeff Stopper, uh, who is an associate professor of biology and director of the brewery science program at Sacred Heart. Uh, he started home brewing 20 years ago, and uh, I met him first when I was uh, getting pizza at bar uh, many years ago, so we thought he might be a nice addition to tonight's class. Um, so I'm going to stop talking, and we're going to start drinking. And you can see from a couple beers that I have in front of me, this should be what is presented for you. Uh, so we're going to start with this guy, which I believe is called Hellas Lager. Uh, I've never had it before. Uh, my dad is a huge lager fan, hates IPAs. So dad, if you're watching, this one's for you. Uh, and right now, I'm going to hand it over to Greg to tell us a little bit about this beer when we start off. So, Greg. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Uh, welcome. I'm going to be talking to you guys about the beers tonight, go through some flavor notes, a little history about each of the beers, and uh, hope you all enjoy them. We're starting off with Raising Hellas. Raising Hellas, as Mike said, is a Hellas-style lager. It is uh, 5% low IBUs, so not a lot of hop bitterness. Uh, Helles is a German style. Uh, Helles literally means light in German, so it's a light bodied and uh, sort of malt focused beer. Uh, soft round, bready, malt, and then accented with uh, Hollertau hops, which are a noble hop from Germany, sort of spicy, floral. Uh, they all come together to a nice balance, easy drinkable beer, and uh, something that's popular with people that are just getting into craft beer, but also people that are been into craft beer for a long time and just appreciate a well-made lager. Um, this beer has been part of our program for a couple years. I think 2019, all the brewers here are big fans of making lagers. Uh, there's a little bit more nuance that goes into the process of making a lager beer. Uh, less to hide behind. Mistakes sort of show themselves, so craftsmanship takes a little bit more, a little more craftsmanship to make these beers well. Uh, we're all a big fan of our Fest beer, which comes out in the fall, and we all kind of wanted another lager beer that was similar that we could have all year round. So this was that beer. Now, uh, Greg, I actually had a quick question on that, because yeah, there might be a couple of folks that are tuning in tonight that aren't as familiar for the process of brewing beer, but also wanted to know the differences between each of the beers that we're having tonight. Sure. So how long approximately is the brewing process for a lager compared to the other beers that you have sure. on site? Yeah, uh, most of our IPAs are... 15 to 20 day beers, meaning from the day they're brewed and knocked out into a fermenter to the day they're actually packaged. Lagers are more like 45 to 60 days. Uh, primary fermentation is a couple weeks, but then they go through a lagering process. Cold conditioned, uh, clarified, just sort of clean up the beer before it's packaged. And I know that's more of the classic kinds of beer that I was just mentioning before. My dad always loved growing up. I know that you really struggle to find really good lagers on the market. Is that because it's so complex to make and there are so many ingredients that come into it? Is it a popularity issue? I just wasn't sure in general why there aren't as many lagers out there that you would normally find. Sure. Well, I mean, IPAs are king, obviously, right now. So when you're making a beer like a lager, you have to consider tank time. You can probably brew three IPAs in the amount of time that you uh, can oh, make wow. one lager. So that needs to be considered. And also, lagers are finally sort of having a little bit of a renaissance. People are starting to drink lagers again from the, in the craft world. And uh, it's just given us a reason to make more of them. This beer has a really classic taste to me. Um, and I'm not a beer aficionado myself, although Phil Pappas from the Connecticut Craft Brewers Guild, uh, someone that I rely on a lot for my expertise in this. But Greg, when I taste this beer, what kind of comes to me first is sort of like a classic Italian lager, like a Peroni. Um, but I don't know if you can compare this to any other beers that you like that you uh, kind of model this after, too. Sure. Um, 
I mean, Hella style is like for for us sort of the classics are German, so obviously and. Um, there wasn't a particular commercial example that we had in mind. We had more of an ingredients in mind. We wanted to use German floor malt and Pilsner malt. We wanted to use Munich and Vienna malt, and we wanted to sort of showcase Hallertau. Hallertau is a hop. It's a noble variety. There's four noble hops. They're all German origins. One of them is grown in Czechoslovakia as well. And so we wanted to highlight four ingredients, really simple process, just yeah. clean, easy drinking beer. And this is super tasty. Um, is this something that I would have to go to Nepco to buy if I was interested in getting it, or would I buy, find it from a package store down the street? No, you'd have to come here to get it in cans, but Got you it. can find it on draft at a lot of bars and restaurants in the state. That's excellent. And hopefully we can uh, all go to a bar and a restaurant together with much more of our friends, about 120 of them that are logged in tonight. Thank you again. If you were putting your kids to sleep and you were getting in late, uh, we're going to be your host for the next hour. Uh, we're having a lot of fun walking you through the different beers that are in front of you. Uh, hopefully you went to Eli Cannons and uh, was it the Blind Rhino in Norwalk? Blind one of the locations or even the Nepco right here. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have gone to Nepco a couple times for beer tastings, but nothing ever quite this exquisite and elaborate. Uh, really impressed with the, the generosity and design and all the work that the Brewery Science Program and Nepco have put in front of us tonight. So I hope everyone is enjoying their first beers. Uh, I, for one, am really enjoying it. How's everyone else enjoying their beer? It's my go-to. Your go-to. <laughs> Excellent. Um, anything else before we kind of transition to the next topic, Ray, that you wanted to wrap up on this beer? No. I just hope everyone enjoys it, and I'm looking forward to uh, presenting the rest of them. That's fantastic. Um, well, coming up next, we're actually going to promote some of the scholarship info that's going to be uh, happening uh, right directly uh, with the program that you are donating to tonight. Um, so we're going to be uploading a video in just a second to talk about that. But I figured I would turn it over to Jeff Stopper to talk a little bit more about the brewery science program. Uh, you may not know that this is Connecticut's first brewery science program. Uh, and as a proud alumnus, I've heard a lot about this as I've gone to uh, Sacred Heart hockey games, uh, basketball games, and other uh, alumni gathering events and homecoming, which hopefully will be coming very soon. Uh, we can get on the field. So I'll hand it over to Jeff to maybe talk a little bit more about the program. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so we are the first brewing science uh, program in Connecticut. Um, we're really um, th the first in the region. We're the closest one to New York City now. Um, so really, there's a whole region here that was kind of unserved with brewing science um, education. Um, so we're happy to kind of step in and fill that void. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're kind of this pipeline to the brewing industry now in Connecticut. Um, and, you know, uh, Part of what you're doing here by you know, having bought these beers and participating in this event is supporting our Black Brewers Scholarship or African American Brewers Scholarship. Um, and you know, if you look at the diversity in the brewing industry, it really doesn't match the diversity in society. Um, and so we want to fix that. And so being part of the pipeline into the brewing industry, um, we're proud to be working with with the uh, Brewers Guild and with New England Brewing Company to, to try to help fix that, to, to make steps towards fixing that. It's a really remarkable mission and drive that you have. As I've seen from your website, this is an over $83 billion industry that keeps growing uh, by the year. And it seems that less than 5% of that workforce is African-American. So it seems like this is an incredible uh, mission-driven cause. Uh, and we're so, again, grateful and thankful for everyone's generosity and support tonight. Uh, so we're really excited to go through those details. Um, we actually did get one question in already, and I, would, I should have promoted this at the very beginning. If you have questions that you'd like us to ask uh, any of our, our panelists, please make sure you're typing it into the chat box, and I'm happy to uh, pose it to them. So Andrew, who I think I know who this is because I had a chance to take a cheat sheet look at uh, all the brewery people that were logged in tonight, wanted to know if you ever get annoyed about how everyone in New England only wants juicy IPAs. Is there ever a bias? And I can already tell from Jamal's response that yes, there is a bias, and he's heard this a lot. But I don't know who wanted to jump in with that one, but I figured I'd pose it because it came in from the audience. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, with the name New England Brewing, uh, a lot of people tend to think that we make New England IPAs, uh, or people that aren't necessarily familiar with the brand. But that isn't our go-to style. Um, we're a little bit more old school than that, and Greg can, can attest to that. We, we definitely dabble in the hazier, juicier beers at times, but. Um, a lot of balance, a lot of, uh, a lot of ability to, to branch out and to do things that are super new and relevant, but uh, not staying in the lane as, as just New England IPAs. That's terrific. And Jamal, actually, if you wouldn't mind elaborating more on the scholarship since you were able to just answer that question, would you mind talking a little bit more about the creation of the scholarship, 
um, specifically, you know, the types of courses you would be taking, how long it, you know, the program is, all those types of details would be awesome for yeah, the members for, of the public to know. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the the whole idea for the scholarship started this summer. We there's a lot of unrest in the in the country, uh, a lot of protests, um, the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, and and so much going on. And we we looked at ourselves as a company and and had to see what we could do in terms of giving back. We do a lot with a lot of other charities, but we didn't have anything focused specifically on black community. And we're in Woodbridge, but we're right down the street from New Haven, and uh, black folks are a big part of our beer drinking community. When you're, when you're drinking beer, and beer in general isn't really a race-focused race thing. It's like good food, good wine, good beer. doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. It's either good or it's not. Um, so for us, we asked ourselves, what can we do? And, and we started this, uh, what we call our Equality IPA series. Um, along with our equality uh, committee, which Greg's a member of. It's a collective of, of employees here at NEBCO. And uh, the goal is to focus on black community with kind of three main objectives. One, to diversify the industry, or uh, to help diversify the industry, to bring some awareness to racial injustice, and to help our, our local black communities. Um, so when we started in our first meeting and deciding how can we help diversify the industry, we've had this, this awesome relationship with uh, Sacred Heart already, and we are accepting interns from that program. So we thought, man, it'd be cool if we could uh, create a scholarship and if, something that, if that's something Sacred Heart would be on board with. And they were ecstatic about it when we reached out and it, it snowballed. It started off, we're like, okay, we, we wanna build something uh, to be able to pay for the whole program. Um, and it's a $15,000 program and it's an 11 month long program. Um, so I had to learn a little bit about how scholarships work and the mm -hmm. money that you raise from the scholarship, the interest from that is what pays for the scholarship itself. So for a $15,000 program, we've got to raise around $250,000 over the next five years. But we didn't want to start, we didn't want to wait five years in order to start some impact. So uh, NEBCO as a whole is doing our annual scholarship where we put someone through the program every year until we build that endowment. Uh, but in the meantime, um, we're, we're raising those funds and the program itself being 11 months long. Um, it's, and it's designed so that you could work your regular job and still do the program if you are transitioning from another career because... That's a, that's a real thing. And now is there a rotation of breweries that are also going to be participating in the brewery science program that continually are within the rotation of students as they get exposure to different types of uh, equipment and also types of beers that they'll be making? Yeah, I think Jeff can, can answer that probably better than I can. Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, we work really closely right now with Two Roads Brewing Company. So um, like Jamal said, it's an 11 month program. It's 22 credits. It's designed like we have, it's a hybrid program. So the, some of the classes are online. Um, the classes that aren't online are in the evenings. Um, so, so, you know, if you work a normal nine to five job, you can do that in the evenings. Um, for internships, so the third semester, it's three semesters long. The third semester you do an internship at one of the breweries that's, that's uh, one of our partners um, and New England's one of them. And most of the breweries in the area um, have been really gracious with their, their time and their knowledge um, and are willing to take on interns. So. Um, we try to hook people up with breweries that have schedules that match with their schedules. Um, so, um, but we work really closely with Two Roads right now. So we have a classroom at Two Roads. Our brewing Excellent. lab is there. Um, John Ream, the head of brewing operations there, is one of our professors. And he teaches the kind of hands-on brewing classes um, there at, at Two Roads um, at Area 2. That's what you see on your screen right now. That's our brewing classroom. Um, and we're really proud of the professional equipment we have in there. Um, and then, you know, we also, so our program is kind of a broad program in brewing, um, rooted in brewing science. So it's rooted in science, but it's a really broad education where you're taking classes on kind of the business and legal aspects of, of running a brewery. Um, and so you learn marketing and stuff, but you also have a lot of hands on brewing. You have the internship where you really get into a brewery. Um, we do a safety class. We have a sanitation and safety class. And you come out with several certificates as well that are industry-wide recognized things like OSHA certification. You come out with the Brewers Association safety certification. Yeah. You come out with Serve Safe Alcohol certification and with the first level of Cicerone certification. I really love that entrepreneurial side of the program because it's great to get one of these degrees and then you can go work for an existing brewery. But what I also love are those stories from the people like yourself that were home brewing for so long that they were able to create their own business. Um, one of the one breweries that I've spent a lot of time getting to know over the years now is Little House in Essex, who are home brewers, who both went to college and just had a love for making beer together. And uh, they've been doing really well. 
Uh, we actually had the governor visit there in December, right before uh, the Christmas holiday, while he was doing some shopping in downtown Essex. So I love that part about your program, that it's not just about learning how to make beer, but it's learning how to launch a business about the beer that you love to make, which I think is a really unique part of this program. And Jamal, thank you so much for all the work you're doing for that scholarship fund. And I think in general, um, what great timing to be marrying all of these uh, wonderful things together for such an awesome program. Um, so I think we're almost ready to kick off into our next beer, which I'm very excited to announce is one of my favorites, and it is Fuzzy Baby Ducks, which if you're a fan of Nepco, you've probably had this beer uh, pop up in a couple of flights and you've said, damn, that's tasty. Uh, and there's nothing else I can really say about it. I just love it so much. So that's going to be the colorful beer that you find over here. Uh, and as I've mentioned, it's probably the most popular beer from Nepco. But enough about me saying stuff about it. I'm going to hand it off to Greg to tell you a little bit more about it. So, Greg, would you mind jumping right in? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, fuzzy. Uh, sort of phenomenon. Uh, before I came to Nepco, I was a Nepco fan. I remember waiting in line right outside this parking lot for fuzzy for several hours. And then shortly after I got here, we released the first can batch of fuzzy. And I remember coming to work about 730 in the morning. There's about 20 cars in the parking lot. I get out of my car. Everyone gets out of their car, starts following me towards the brewery. I said, guys, I work here. I work here. I'm not going to be first in line. Go back to your cars, relax. I think we opened that day at, geez, 10 or 11. And we were packaging fuzzy that day on the canning line. Literally, cases coming off the line. Rob's son, Will, was coming and grabbing a case, bringing it to the customer. So we don't do that anymore. Now we package the day before because we learned our lesson. But anyway, fuzzy uh, features citra. Citra is a hop. Um, Originally grown at Peralt Farms in the Yakima Valley. Uh, Jason Peralt was the guy that came up with Citra. Citra was a hop that sort of took off really quickly. First year Citra came out, even before it had a name, it was an X hop, an X114. And uh, Widmer won gold for an IPA at JBF, even before Citra had a name. The year after, Sierra Nevada used it in the first version of the Torpedo, and then the rest is history from there. Citra is a really interesting hop. Uh, it has a really high myrcene content. Myrcene is one of the four major hop oils. And myrcene is also found in mango and in tangerine. So all that citra quality shares that citrus oil with those fruits. So sort of makes sense. Greg, I, I'm going to interrupt you just because my board is exploding with questions from our audience. And I am uh, sure that is because as they taste beer, there are just a flood of thoughts coming to their head. So I'm going to take this one by one. And thank you so much for submitting your questions so far. Um, so the first question we have that I think is relevant to what we were just talking about is from Phyllis and Matt, who asked that, should we be seeking a particular taste of flavor with any one of these beers? Uh, should we be kind of hoping that we're going to uh, identify it like one thing, like when you do wine and you try to taste a particular type of grape or an accent or a vegetable? Is there anything that specifically should be the first sip and thought you should have when you're like doing a fuzzy baby duck, for example? Sure. Um, and an IPA, aromatics are the first thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, such a major part of IPAs. Most of your aromatics come from either late kettle additions, whirlpool, or, but mostly dry hopping. And uh, this is a beer that gets a very big dry hop of a lot of expensive citra hops. Um, so that's where you start with an IPA. And then sort of in flavor, uh, there should be some balance of malt with those hops. So mm -hmm. hop flavors in a beer like this would be tangerine, citrus. You get a little bit of mango, some sort of tropical flavors. A little bit of pine resin bitterness behind that, and then the malt should balance that with a little bit of sweet breadiness, and then uh, yeah, finish clean and dry. And that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the travel that you usually get with an IPA. That's excellent. And just out of my own curiosity, do a lot of these ingredients come locally? Do they come kind of regionally? Is there a good mix of both? Hops for us are either mostly come from Pacific Northwest or yeah. from overseas. There are hop farms in Connecticut, and the products are definitely getting better and better every year. But uh, just for the amount of hops we use, most of our hops do come from large hop growers in uh, Yakima Valley. Mainly. Terrific. And uh, Jennifer, uh, thank you for this question, because I think it's on everyone's minds. And uh, there's, there's no such thing as a boring question, including this one, which is, what is meant by a juicy IPA? I know we kind of you know, glazed over that. We kind of jumped into, do people like juicy IPAs compared to other beers? But what makes a, an IPA juicy? Sure. Um, Juicy IPAs are typically more flavor and aromatic focus, less bitterness, and typically have a little bit more residual sweetness. Also, ester compounds or different yeast strains can throw a lot more sort of fruit flavors. And so sort of the combination of those being more flavor driven, less bitter, like a classic IPA, and um, just a lot more aromatic with 
juicy notes, you know. And Rich uh, just submitted a great question, which I think probably is one that's on everyone's mind, which is where did the name come from? What was the origin? So I'll tell this the best I can because the mind of Craig Gilbert is a weird place. And uh, my understanding is, I think this beer might've had a couple different ideas, including fluffy puppies, I think at one point. <laughs> and I think it was just sort of a response that Craig thought it'd be really funny for someone to come into the brewery and try to order a fuzzy baby ducks. <laughs> and at first he, we sort of thought it would be silly and people wouldn't want to do it. And it just sort of took off now people love to say it. So yeah, that's the well, you're, you're spending a lot of time making the beer. So I'm sure that there are a lot of different names that kind of come to your head in those moments. So that's great that those inside jokes carry over really well. For sure. Uh, that's fantastic. We have a couple of other questions that came in, uh, which a lot of them are have to do with the program, which we can get to a, into a sec. But um, I did get one question about raising Hellas, which is why does it almost have a white wine smell? So that again, for those who might have been tuning in a little bit later, that's going back to the first beer that we had that it, it has some sort of aroma that I guess would be like a Sauvignon Blanc or a Chardonnay. Is that normal that it would have a white wine smell? I think that maybe that might be coming from the hops. Um, some hops can exhibit a bit of a white wine character. To me, it's more spicy. I'm not actually a huge wine guy, so I don't really have a direct comparison to. Yeah, no, and I think that goes back to the aroma that you were just mentioning before about the tangerine and the other things that remind us about those flavors when they get combined. Sure. Um, I think that's terrific. And I mean, everyone's favorite thing about New Haven beer and New Haven pizza are marrying the two, right? I know that NEPCO has been really famous about doing a lot of partnerships with New Haven businesses, including New Haven pizza. Um, what's your favorite food to have at this? Uh, is there something that in particular you always pair with a fuzzy baby duck to use a wine term? Uh, me personally, uh, with an IPA, I, maybe Indian food, I think is a there good pairing. Go. Uh, with pizza, it's usually Pilsner's. I like oh, a gotcha. lager with pizza. Yeah, that's great. How about you guys? Always a lager when it comes to, actually, that's not true. Whatever's cold. <laughs> but I, uh, Hellas is a great pizza beer for me. Excellent. I love that one, yeah. Really cool. What do you think, Jeff? I'd probably have some cheese with it. Yeah. Some cheddar. <laughs> That's excellent. And I know that uh, everyone tonight is probably coming in with their own hometown favorite recipes that they like to have when they make food and beer and pair them together. Uh, we were actually able to cool these beers off right before we got on set tonight, about an hour before. Uh, and there was a, an amazing food truck outside tonight that we got to sample some hamburgers at, which was awesome. Uh, and I really hope that everyone's enjoying the experience so far. Again, for those who might be participating a little bit later than normal, uh, we are now on our second of the four beers. Uh, which we're really excited to walk people through. And uh, all your support tonight goes directly to the African American Brewery Science Pro, uh, Scholarship Fund. And uh, as I looked online tonight before this event started, we were already at 52 sponsors of people who weren't even registered to come in tonight, which by the way is sold out, 120 participants in a span of three weeks. Just an unbelievable response for a series of these fundraisers that we're going to be having. Uh, so we would love you to do uh, one of our next fundraisers that'll be at Two Roads, I believe, on April 8th. And we'll, we'll put in a plug at the very end of this. Um, but we're very excited for this uh, series of events that are going to be taking place for uh, an amazing cause with a scholarship fund. Um, so just to get back to some of the questions, and thank you so much for the enthusiasm. I don't know if we're going to get to every question, but we'll try our best to. Um, someone asked, um, what causes the cloudiness in the fuzzy baby ducks? not exactly sure what that means, but maybe yeah, you can no, educate me on that. No, exactly what it means. Um, cloudiness can come from a lot of different things. For our beers, typically cloudiness comes from a process that happens during dry hopping. And it's uh, just basically oils from the hops, just staying in solution. Gotcha. That's great. And then um, someone else asked, um, can you discuss the different hop profiles between FBD, um, Corolius, Supernaut, Face Hugger, and g -Bot? Jeez, that's a lot of beers. Yeah, I just threw um, a lot at you there. Yeah. All right, first one's fuzzy. So uh, Citra, uh, Tropical Fruits, Tangerine, um, Orange Zest. Uh, next is Coriolis. Nelson Savin, it's a New Zealand hop. Additionally, it was really a, uh, speaking of wine, it was a really a white wine forward hop. And then sort of lower notes of like goat gooseberries, um, lychee fruit. It's a really interesting hop. Uh, what was the next one? Supernaut? Um, yes. Mosaic. Uh, mosaic is sort of classic pineapple. It's a little, got a little dank undertones. Uh, mosaic can be pretty catty, but, uh, but mostly just a lot of, to me, a lot of pineapple. 
And then was there one more? Uh, so we had Facehugger and Gbot, but let's let's okay. hold off on the Gbot. <laughs> I know we have a very eager audience. That's our third beer. We'll we'll save that recipe since that's one of the older beers from Nepco as well. Um, but what about Facehugger? Facehugger. It's a new beer. Uh, just back to the market now, so it's out there in cans. Uh, features Simcoe, which uh, to me. Our Simcoe lease is pretty mango heavy, but also Simcoe has an association with cattiness, which is um, litter box, I guess. Oh, <laughs> I see. Okay. Um, but our Simcoe, do our Simcoe doesn't go there. So our Simcoe is pretty mango heavy, and that's paired with Amarillo, another really high mercine content hop, so a lot more citrus as well. That's excellent. And, and terrific questions, and we really appreciate the enthusiasm of all of our participants tonight. Again, if you're joining us late, we appreciate your support and help throughout this program. Uh, you're definitely walking you through tonight on the brewery science uh, tour and guild of everything that we're doing at NEPCO and look forward to continuing this at Two Roads on April 8th. Uh, but we are live at NEPCO now, uh, again, socially distanced by beer barrels and, and being able to walk everyone through these beers. And hopefully you're winding down your second beer and getting ready to uh, come into your third. I think in general, uh, one of the questions I had, which I know comes up a, for a lot from when I talk to people about beer is, so can you talk to me about the difference between canned beer and bottled beer? So I know that bottled beer gets exposed to, I think, more sunlight, right? Which causes it to not have as long of a shelf life. Is that the primary purpose of having cans? Is there another reason I might be leaving out as to why you find a lot more cans these days than bottles? Sure. Um, cans are better um, for a lot of reasons. Simple enough. I like it. Um, people are sort of concerned with cans like, oh, there's going to be a metal taste because they're metal. There's a liner in the can. The beer never touches. Uh, the metal, it's a sealed container, no light gets in. Uh, you can transport it to bring it to the beach, bring it to the park. You're not leaving bottles behind that are getting broken. Mm. It's a more environmentally friendly form of packaging and uh, it's just easier. So yeah, I'm, I'm outside of, there are beers that should be bottle conditioned and those should go in a bottle and those are, um, that's typically a different process. But for beers like this, I think cans are just a much better option. Seems to make a lot of sense. And I think everybody can get behind taking a beer to the beach, right? So it sounds great. But we are really excited to share with everyone uh, the NEPCO brewing process. And we we'll have about a five minute video to show you. So why don't we uh, jump right to that quickly? We begin the tour outside of our brew house at our grain silo. The silo hosts 50,000 pounds of grain. supplies the base malt for a majority of our beers. In addition to our silo malt, much of our specialty malt comes from bags of grain. Here you can see bags of grain being lined up to go into the mill. Milled malt goes through an auger system into a grist bin. From the grist bin, it's then augered up to the brew deck to the mash tun. At the mash tun, water is added to the grain and collected in the mash tun. This is where a process called sacrification happens. The starch from the malt is converted with hot water to create sugar. After runoff is complete, the mash rakes are ran to remove excess liquid. We then collect the spent grain in totes. Here you can see the spent mash being collected in totes. These totes are picked up by local farmers and used to feed their livestock. Now we move on to the boil kettle. Liquid collected from the mash tun is now in the boil kettle, boiling, and this is where hops are added. Pelletized hops are measured out and added to the boil at different times. These additions can impart bitterness, aroma, or flavor. After the boil, liquid is moved to the whirlpool. Liquid enters the whirlpool from the side of the tank at an angle and creates a whirlpool effect that collects hops in the center and leaves clean liquid to the outside. This liquid, now free of solids, travels to the heat exchanger. The exchanger works by cold water entering one channel through a series of plates while hot wort travels through in another direction. This process instantly cools the wort to an optimal temperature for pitching yeast. It's important to hit this optimal temperature for a healthy and vigorous fermentation. Oxygen is also added during knockout to aid in a healthy fermentation. Wort then travels through a knockout hose to a fermenter. Depending where this fermenter is, this is sometimes a long journey. This is where fermentation begins. In this temperature controlled fermenter, yeast begins eating sugar that was created during the brewing process. 
There are two main byproducts of this process, alcohol and CO2. Here you can see CO2 escaping the fermenter into something called a blow-off bucket. After about a week, more hops are added to the fermenter. This is called dry hopping. A few days later, we begin to lower the temperature of the fermenter. Lowering the temperature allows solids such as yeast and hops to settle to the cone of the fermenter. This lowered temperature also prepares the beer for the next step. Finished uncarbonated beer is then transferred to a bright tank. In the bright tank, CO2 is introduced to carbonate the beer. From the bright tank, beer can be packaged in different formats. This could be things such as kegs or cans. Here you can see new, empty cans being depalletized. Cans are pushed along onto a conveyor to be date coated. Cans are then rinsed and moved on to the fillers. We have a 10 head filler. This means 10 cans of beer are filled at the same time. CO2 is introduced to the cans to purge any oxygen before filling. Here you can see three rows of cans. Cans come in in the back row, are purged with CO2 in the second row, and then filled with beer on the front row. Foam on the beer helps avoid headspace until lids are dropped onto the cans. Cans are then moved to a pair of seamers where cans are spun and then crimped to seal the can. Cans are then sent through a rinser and a dryer, kind of like a car wash. The next step is to label the cans. After the labeler, cans run through a pack tech machine, which groups the cans into a six pack. Six packs are then put into cases and stacked on a pallet, ready for shipment. Simply incredible, right? Like when you watch that video, how a human hand does not touch that beer until the very end of that process and packaging, which I think is just fascinating on a nerd-like level uh, for me really like geeking out on this stuff. Um, but I wanted to turn it over to Greg because we had a couple great questions come in after that video and we appreciate your participation and feel free to pose more questions and we're gonna try to get to all of them as best we can. Uh, so Greg, amazing labels on those cans. Can you talk about the design of them, the printing of them, the production of them? Does that happen in-house? Does that happen with a, a local company that you like to work with outside of this brewery? Um, yeah, uh, some of both. Okay, um, cool. We have an in-house designer, his name is Craig Gilbert. He also works in the tap room. He's been with Nebco for almost since the beginning. Wow. And uh, he does all the designs, mostly the illustrations. And then we work with a um, uh, branding company called Hops and Branding, a guy named Nick Gamma, a good friend of mine. And he helps Craig lay out all the text, artwork, make sure it's print ready. And then the labels are printed in Connecticut, up in Ellington, Connecticut. Oh, wow. And then uh, brought down here. So would you say that the canning process for getting things ready for uh, customers to take out the door, does that take after you've brewed a beer about a day, a couple days? Is there a longer production timeline to actually can the beer and get it out the door? Um, so typically... So you saw the bright tank, which is where beer is carbonated. Typically we'll carbonate one day and then within the next day or two, we'll package the beer and the beer will typically go out the door that day or the next day. So is it ever based on demand of a particular type of beer being more popular than the other? Absolutely. Yeah. A big part of the job is, um, and Jamal is a big part of this is, uh, recognizing demand in the market and making sure that you have beer ready to meet that demand. Someone calls you up and says, I need 100 cases of something. It's not like it's here. We have to brew it. It's going to take a couple of weeks. So just recognizing that demand ahead of time and making sure we have those products ready is a big part of it. Jamal, I wanted to turn it over to you as director of sales. Do you ever find that there's a particular type of beer that you're always trying to keep up with demand and the quantity of? <laughs> sea Hag. <laughs> oh, okay. Day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've uh, seen that in a couple of places. Yeah. Sea Hag uh, represents the bulk of our business, about 80% of our total production okay. volume. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we, we get challenged a little bit because... 
people love sea hag and they're buying it all the time but they also want to see other things and our guys want to brew other things too so it's trying to find that balance of bringing new and innovation and, and doing fun stuff but also making sure that we fit the demand of, of the people that want to drink sea hag every single day and be able to put keep that in their fridge all the time an incredibly popular beer that's not on our list tonight because we wanted to get everybody in a more uh, adventurous spirit is to try different beers uh, that is also available at Nepco. But Sea Hag is certainly one to Jamal's point that I've heard a lot about, drinking a lot actually as well, uh, and seen on tap at a lot of restaurants. Um, but I think the beers tonight are really unique in that some of them can only be bought at Nepco, with the exception of our next beer, which is Gbot. Uh, so I'm not sure. Maybe Greg, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about this beer. Sure. Yeah, Gbot. And open uh, it up. This one goes back a long time. I, think, I want to say 2007 was when this beer came out. Uh, to me, it's a classic West Coast double IPA. Uh, big bitterness, resiny, pine, orange rind. It's got some dankiness to it. Uh, there was sort of a trend in IPAs in the mid 90s. They sort of called it the IBU wars, where everyone was making more bitter and bitter beers. You know, 100 IBU beers, 120 IBU beers. And uh, I always found Gbot. Although it's a high bitterness beer, 85 IBUs, always was an exception to that because it always had great malt balance, uh, really good aromatics, and uh, it, it was more balanced than a lot of those beers. And just growing up as a beer fan, this was one that I was always excited to get. And I definitely remember when I first started at Nepco and being on that brew deck and brewing G-Bot for the first time was definitely a proud moment. So can you tell us the story about how Gandhi Bot became G-Bot? Because that just came in as a question from one of our viewers. Yeah, I think I can. I think I can do it pretty well. You, you want to say that for when Rob's on uh, camera? Oh, potentially you're better than me at this. I said it's like a great idea. We okay. can definitely do that. Cool. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll pivot to a second, maybe back to the production, because they did have a couple of questions that came sure. in. Um, but so would you say that the uh, aluminum shortage that happened in the past year had a uh, crunching demand on your business? How were you able to navigate through that? Any anecdotal stories you wanted to share about that? Yeah, it got weird for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we never ran out of cans. Uh, we came close, uh, but we were repurposing some cans. So I'm sure some people saw out there, you might have saw fuzzy cans with a Sea Hag sticker over them in the market. Okay. Oh, wow. So we had to use other brands' cans for Sea Hag mainly in the market just to get through. And fortunately, we got a lot of cans in recently and we're good. But uh, yeah, that's been... Uh, there was an aluminum shortage and a CO2 shortage at the same time, and those are uh, two things that are critical to our business. And fortunately, we slid through and we were okay. So we actually had a participant submit a question about CO2, so that's a great segue. Um, do you change the amount of CO2 that's introduced into each beer based on the style, such as a Pilsner or a Stout? For sure, yeah. Uh, CO2 is a, a big part of the experience of drinking beer. Uh, brings the aromatics to the nose initially when you're opening and also it's part of the body uh, makes a beer more crisp uh, can add a small amount of acidity to a beer just through carbonic acid but yeah a pilsner is typically carbonated a little higher to keep it a little more uh, bright and uh, refreshing and uh, ipas are typically i guess a little lower than stouts are definitely on the lower end of the co2 range so then uh, is there a quality control aspect to the production process that was another question that we just got yeah. i know you had just mentioned having to relabel certain cans to meet the demand, but are there other quality measures that uh, folks at home might be interested to know about? Sure, yeah, QC and QA are a huge part of um, mine and everyone's jobs here. Uh, from the tank being prepped correctly, um, cost cleaned and uh, sanitized correctly all the way through to making sure uh, fermentation is uh, done at the right temperature uh, with the right amount of yeast introduced. There's a million things, but yes, there's a QC is, is really the game for making sure you have a consistent and a quality product. Excellent. I, I know the person from our production team has been feverishly typing in these questions and must be sweating because there's a lot of them coming in. Uh, so again, I will emphasize, if you have any other questions, they are available all the time at NEPCO. Uh, we encourage you to come visit them in person, hopefully. I will get through as many as I can, but we have a very enthusiastic audience. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, pull out of this array of questions was that Gbot seems to have a nice dry finish, which I would agree with as well. Uh, is that ingredient driven, process driven, or a combination of both? Uh, both, yeah. Uh, Gbot is pretty well attenuated for a double IPA. It dries out quite a bit. Uh, it has a lot to do with mash temperature, and then also the yeast strain that we use, and then also the bitterness can accentuate the dryness as well. 
So Jivat, I know, is one of those beers where I can actually find that in the package store. I don't have to go to Nepco to find that beer. Now, is that a result of just demand over the years because it's been on the market longer that people have, you've integrated into stores? Or what kind of made that determination in doing that? Yeah, uh, I think Jivat was it originally a distro brand, and I think um, Rob's been always uh, loyal to the distribution mark, uh, customers out there, liquor stores bars, uh, restaurants, and we've always wanted to make sure that they're getting those kind of brands out there that they can sell. So yeah, g always been a distro brand. Some of the other brands are a little harder to distro only because the ingredients aren't as plentiful. Uh, so typically if we can't get enough out there to supply the whole state, we tend to keep them as an in-house beer. That's, and, and as we're talking about in-house beers and also beers that are distributed off-premise, I know that the Equality IPA, which is something that Jamal had talked about, which was in massive production in the past year, uh, was something that we were hoping to learn a little bit more about. Um, so would you mind just kind of telling us a little more information about what the future of Equality IPA might bring and how you came about doing that? Yeah, I can speak on the technical aspect of it, and Jamal might talk more about where those funds go. Great. Um, I brew all the Equality IPAs on our pilot system. We have a three and a half barrel uh, pilot system here at NEPCO, and they're taproom only beers. 100% of the proceeds go to the charity. And uh, I think we're going to probably be brewing them between once every two to three months. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. And Jamal, I know you started talking about the Equality IPA. Can you talk a little bit more about where those funds go and in general the future of uh, maybe making more of it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we wanted to instill in our culture. When we started the Equality Committee, we wanted to do something that was continuously giving back. And not just we brewed a Black is Beautiful beer, which the proceeds of that will go towards the scholarship, but we wanted to do something that was kind of just a part of what we do. So that's kind of where the Equality IPA uh, started and, and where it's going. The funds from that go directly to the committee So and whatever the committee's working on. So if that's something in the community, if that's the scholarship, if that's, it'll, it'll vary depending on what the, the task is at the time. And then we try to team up with some other breweries to be a part of that. Um, our next one is going to be in collaboration with Rhythm Brewing, um, which will be very cool. But uh, but yeah, the proceeds are, will always go to the Equality Committee, which is focused on, on the black community. That's excellent. I know that marries well with the Undivided IPA, which has been promoted by the Connecticut Brewers Guild, uh, which has been uh, brewed by a number of different members of the guild and, and also sponsored for uh, the COVID-19 response fund for frontline workers uh, that are specifically affected in terms of service jobs um, you know, that are going to be continuously promoted through this process of having that beer available. Um, I think it's just terrific that the Equality IPA has been able to make such a difference, have those funds attributed to such an awesome program. And in general, uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for growth on that beer. So that's really terrific that you guys have launched that. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to talk about in NEPCO tonight is the fact that they have a number of different beers that you can come and sample on site. I believe it's 20 different beers that you guys have when I pulled off the website, Absolutely. roughly in that ballpark. Uh, is there anyone in particular that's not on this list tonight before we kind of break into our next video that you thought was like kind of a close fifth, I would call it, or something else that we probably should have thrown in there and maybe would think about for the next run? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it really had a lot to do with production schedule, quite sure. honestly. Yeah. Um, I, 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 if I'm going to drink a hoppy beer here, I typically go towards Supernaut, and I think Supernaut would have been a great beer to introduce to people that maybe are sea hag drinkers that have seen Supernaut on the shelves and haven't, haven't had it yet. But um, yeah, that probably would have been my next choice. How about you, Jamal? Um, I drink a lot of our, our bigger beers when I'm here. All the the ISTs, a lot of the IST variants are, are on tap right now, and and uh, you can't get those very often. So that's one that I would steer people to if, if we could. And Unfortunately, it, it, we don't do those in cans and the the vintages all the time. But um, when they're on tap, we got to grab it. Excellent. I think we have a lot of members from the public in our tasting room outside <laughs> that are sampling that because they're really excited about it. <laughs> Jeff, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you have any ones that are on that list? I'd, I, on, as far as the top list, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm guilty of contributing to the 80% of their business that is Sea Hag. <laughs> um, it's a really just a really nice drinking beer. I really like It's a nice, clean, crisp IPA. It's just a good go-to. Brian Flaherty from our office. Uh, I work for Sullivan and Lachane, which is a government affairs firm in Hartford. I know he's watching tonight and really happy because he keeps about a six pack of Sea Hag a week uh, up there. And he, I know he was here yesterday picking up his beer. So shout out to you, Brian. Thanks for participating. Uh, up next, we have a second video coming up that I believe is ready to go on the history of NEPCO, which started in 2001 and in 2002 opened up here, uh, which was really exciting to talk about. 
So to begin the history of New England Brewing Company, uh, I'd like to start with how I got into the brewing industry, and that was many years ago, 1992, um, showing up to help a friend out at New Haven Brewing in New Haven. A gorgeous old building. Uh, I didn't know what I was walking into, but I never walked out. I'm still in the industry today, loving every minute of it. And it kind of led me to um, an opportunity when I was at New England Brewing Company in Norwalk to um, to buy the brand name and start the new brewery here in Woodbridge, Connecticut. So when I started Selden Street New England Brewing Company there, I, I forgot one key ingredient and that was uh, securing funds. The money part was, was really important and I didn't have any. We were draft only and I could not afford a bottling machine but uh, as fate would have it, I got an email from a, a small canning company that had a two head can filler and then a seamer which is one at a time and then you put the cans in a six pack holder one at a time and you would be there standing all day but I knew it was a great idea for me because I can afford to get this machine and I also knew that it was better for the beer than selling the beer in growlers and liquor stores or even bottles no light would get in no air would get in everyone thought I was crazy uh, so it was really cool to see a few years later that everybody is canning beer now and I can't say that's because of me I can't say that I was some genius, it just happened that way. It took about a good 10 years before things started turning around. There's some great brands like Sea Hag coming to life, Gandhi Bot. Uh, those brands actually killed the original flagship of Atlantic Amber. So as the demand was picking up, it was getting impossible to, to can these beers by hand and cue the angels singing. We scrapped enough money together to get that real big boy can filler and that, that really changed the game. Instead of producing 80 to 100 cases a day, and that, that's a grueling day, we were producing three to 400 cases a day and actually filling orders. We had added more fermenters to the little tiny Selden Street to a point where we were taking most of the pallets out at the beginning of the day so we can work and then we'd stuff everything back in at the end of the day and then leave. We really had to find a new home and as luck would have it right across the street 175 Yemeni Road it was a great space. When I first saw it I'm like I will never fill this space. We put our little brewery in there and it was cavernous. There was so much room and we only had a section of the building. But as time grew on, we took over a back warehouse. We took over the upstairs. Uh, we added more and more tanks to the point now that we cannot fit another tank. We couldn't make another drop of beer in this place and are now planning on the third and hopefully final home of New England Brewing Company that will allow us to make as much beer as we could possibly dream to make. It's a, it really is a dream come true. If I were to say the name Leonard in Norwalk, it sounds like you might be thinking of Stu Leonard's, but in fact, I'm talking about Rob Leonard from Nepco in Woodbridge. Uh, so we're really uh, pleased and happy that Nepco has been such an amazingly generous and contributing partner to some tasteful brews that you're having right now uh, and sharing the history of Nepco. So Rob, welcome and thank you so much for having us here. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties that we were just going through. Um, would you mind just walking through, just because we had some uh, sound difficulties before, uh, the history of NEPCO? I, I guess you were founded in 2001, I saw on your website? Right, in 2001, 2002, whatever it took. Um, yeah, it was, I was brewing for Norwalk when the brewery was there and the company was there. I was the head brewer and the owners sold it. Long story short, I came up with the name and I moved it up here to the New Haven County area uh, in Woodbridge and it's... It was a struggle at first. Uh, I don't know if the story really told it well from the video, but it was kind of like a one-man show, a two-man show. There was a canned beers by hand for 10 years, and slowly we acquired an amazing team that you're meeting tonight, and it, I'm like the proud father. That's incredible. Crying. 
I know there's, than, there's right. a great entrepreneurial spirit of this program, and you are the cornerstone of someone who I think a lot of the people that are in the program would want to, you know, get test the expertise of to see what it takes to start one of these brewery programs. Is there one little like tidbit of advice you'd like to give for people that are in the program, someone who's trying to start a small business, especially during COVID, as people have had to pivot and re-engineer, you know, what their career paths have gone into? Is there any piece of advice you'd like to put out there tonight? There, there is. Um, the, the funny one is like, don't do it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but there's another one that my mom always told me, like, if you believe in something, keep at it and it's going to happen. And when you're in it and it's not working and you're struggling, you keep at it. Just keep at it. I didn't quit and I didn't quit. And there's so many times other people wanted to throw in the towel for me. And I, it's like, dude, you got to like, no, I, I, I kept that. So just please keep Keep at it as best you can. And if, you, if it's your dream, it's your passion, it'll work. It's got to be something you live and breathe. And, and on behalf of um, just the brewery science program, seeing how you support 28 employees in this very difficult environment, I applaud you. That's an amazing feat that you've accomplished. And to our viewers at home, um, just want to say how, how amazing this is to be a part of such an amazing brewery and an incredible program. Uh, and Rob's generosity that has kind of produced all this has really made this a worthwhile effort as well. Um, but I think it's almost time to break into our fourth beer, which we're very excited about. But before we do that, I did want to talk to Rob a little bit about some of the questions that we got um, to see if you would be able to help address them. Because we did get an interesting question about Gbot, which is, would you mind telling the story about how Gandhibot became Gbot? Yeah, that's a painful one. Almost, uh, <laughs> almost lost my marriage to that one. But uh, it, it was Gandhibot for forever. And the story was amazing. Uh, we were working on a double IPA. We needed a name. Craig rolled in on, a, on his bike and like, Craig, we need a name for a new beer we're doing. And Craig says, uh, what, what, it's a double IPA. Um, we say, okay, um, Gandhi bot. And we're, how did that just fall out of your head? <laughs> He's like, I, I was just, uh, IPA, India, it's going to be canned, metal, robot, uh, Gandhi bot. I'll come up with a sketch tonight. And he did. He came up with a sketch of, immortalizing Gandhi doing the robot dance. And we thought it was, it was awesome. It was a tribute to Gandhi. We did it for about five years hmm. until we pissed off a uh, continent of India. And uh, I didn't want to change it. I was, I was like, it doesn't need to be changed, but this will blow over in two weeks. But I had younger employees uh, that, you know, were scared. It was, uh, they thought people are going to shoot up the brewery. I tried to say, well, Hindus, that's not their thing. They don't really do that. Uh, but I wanted a safe environment for everybody. And it's like, okay, we'll compromise. We'll call it Gbot. And, and that's how that came. So I love that story. That's really interesting. It actually reminds me of another question that I wanted to ask you tonight. I was really enthusiastic about it is, as a business owner that's been wildly successful and has had a lot of great stories over the years, was there ever that one moment where you kind of drew your line in the sand and you were like, you know, I should be compromising on this, but I really like this idea and I really want to stick with it. And your your intuition actually led to be successful uh, above all the odds of people telling you, no, don't do that, Rob, you know, something like that. <laughs> One was starting a brewery. Which, uh, <laughs> okay, um, fair enough. But I think canning, putting the beer in cans. I, see. I if, if I could tell it, I would sound like a genius. Like, oh, I knew this was the future. Everyone's going to... They're conscious about the environment and aluminum can be recycled and it's better for the beer. It was out of necessity. I couldn't afford to bottle beer. I, did, I couldn't do it. The machines are too expensive. Uh, the labeling, the, the packaging, everything was against uh, all odds. I, I just couldn't do it. I didn't want to contract the beer and have someone pick it up and like, oh, this is not even made there. And I happened to get an email from a company like we have this hand canning machine. You can can your beer. And it was $10,000. I could afford it. Uh, the can was 10 cents. The label's already included because it's printed. I'm like, so I just started doing it that way. And I was like the third in the country to do craft beer and cans. That's People incredible. thought I was insane. And I'd go like, do you have bottles? Like, no, I just invested $10,000. That's everything I have. This is all I have. <laughs> um, and then slowly, as luck would have it, other people started doing it. And it looks like I started it. I, I definitely did not start it. But it was So a Rob, inquiring minds would like to know about your plans for a new brewery. Uh, would you mind talking about that for a bit? Yeah, I, when it, we came across the street from Selden Street to here, that move was so intense and I swore on baby Jesus, we will never ever move again. This is it. 
I'm going to live and die here because it was, it's a big ordeal. We're moving again. Yes, that, that, that's <laughs> uh, When we came in here, it was still cavernous. There was tons of room. You can roller skate around and have dance parties. But uh, as the years went on, more tanks came in, more tanks came in, more tanks came in uh, to the point there's going to be tanks in people's offices here. So we, we just can't do that. We ran out of electricity. We have temporary electricity service to uh, activate the chillers that, that we're running. So we, we do have plans, I think, within a year and a little bit because of COVID. We'll be in a new home. Uh, I don't want to announce where, but it will be close by. No one has to travel too far. But it's going to be a, an amazing place. That's exceptionally exciting, and I really appreciate you sharing those heartfelt stories that you uh, had great experiences with. If you would join us for our last beer, we'd be honored. Oh, I'd love uh, it. Especially because it's the, is it the Coffee Birth? Is that what this is called? Coffee, coffee Breath. breath? Coffee Breath. Uh, which Greg is going to walk us through exactly uh, what the fun features of this beer are. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, Coffee Breath. Uh, it is a, an Imperial Coffee Oat Milk Stout. So I guess we can break that down. Imperial means it's strong. Coffee, that part's easy. Oats, uh, we use oats in the mash. Oats are great for mouthfeel. Sort of uh, soften up the mouthfeel, give you a little bit of slickness. Uh, the milk part, uh, it's milk sugar. So if you're lactose intolerant, I don't know. Drink it at your own risk. And then stout, it's a stout. Um, now it tells me. You'll be okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a big old coffee beer. Uh, we make it once or twice a year. Uh, we work with a local roaster called One World uh, Roasters. They're in East Haven. They're an all organic roaster. They're awesome. They do online ordering and they'll deliver coffee to your house. So you should order coffee from them because they're great people. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really grown in popularity since I've been here. Uh, I get a lot of emails, when's Coffee Breath coming out? Mm -hmm. It's a weird times of the year, like in the middle of August. So like, I don't, you don't want to drink that right now, right. but they do. Uh, we have this guy, Tom Emmy, he's probably watching and I, I said his name and now, he's gonna um, show up. yeah, he'll probably show up. <laughs> uh, it's always stout season for Tom M. And uh, yeah, so he's the one guy that wants the, the stouts in the middle of August. So we keep them to the winter mainly. So when you're making coffee breath, what part of the process is coffee added? And what kind of coffee do you use in that brewing yeah, process? It's a good question. Uh, you can do it a lot of different ways. The way we do it is we add coffee to the fully fermented beer in the fermenter at 50 degrees. Uh, sort of makes the beer into like cold brew. So ground coffee in these giant bags like you would make cold brew, dropped into the top of the tanks. Getting them out of the tanks is a little tricky. Um, and then, yeah, it just seeps, uh, steeps in the coffee uh, for a little while. And the, the beans in this one are Sumatra and uh, uh, Dominican uh, Duarte beans. Excellent. And, and do you find that this is one that gets, you had mentioned seasonally in August, it's rare, you know, because people are looking for colder drinks. But do you find that this is a beer that pairs well on certain events that you host at site in EPCO? Or is this mostly folks that just uh, like to take it home and take it uh, for a drink whenever they'd like? I think we do pretty well with stouts on, on premise. Uh, we usually have uh, two plus stouts most of the year. Um, but yeah, it's a canned beer that we don't do a ton of. And it, it moves pretty quickly. So I think people do come here to take it home with them. And uh, it's eight and a half percent. So uh, it's definitely one that you can enjoy on your couch at home. That's pretty reasonable. Yeah, and I know that a lot of stouts in general are pretty easy to drink. It's got that smooth balance and taste, especially a lot of people that like coffee. Uh, and this is no different, a terrific, terrific beer. If you'd like to come by and grab one, it's excellent. Uh, I love coffee and I love stouts, uh, but I am you know, choosy when it comes to my stouts, especially around St. Patrick's Day, but this is one that's definitely on my list for that time of year. Um, you know, before we kind of hand it off and do our thank yous and, and hopefully everyone is uh, uh, getting the aroma from all these beers and having a lot of fun, is there any other um, information you'd like to share just personally about you, how people can get in touch with you uh, if they have additional questions that we weren't able to address tonight? Yeah. Um, any questions that people might have, you can email me at the brewery, greg at newenglandbrewing.com. I'm glad to answer questions as long as they're not too weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and personally, I'm just so thankful and grateful that we were able to have this opportunity tonight to connect with all of you at home. Uh, if you've been with us from, you know, cradle to grave from seven o'clock till now, thank you for your patience. Uh, you know, we're walking through this as one of many series of uh, events that we're going to be having in promotion of this great program. 
on April 8th, we'll be uh, going to two roads and doing a similar event like this. Uh, but I could say for sure, uh, this was a very unique and special one. And I just want to say a special thank you to all of our participants tonight. Uh, Jeff, Greg, Rob, and Jamal. Uh, this was truly a special occasion. Uh, one that I think we'll all remember for a really long time. Hopefully have a beer over uh, and not six feet apart when things calm down. That would be great. Uh, but I'm, I'm really um, thrilled and excited to be a part of the series with you all. Uh, so thank you for all the contributions you've made so far to date. And uh, thank you at home uh, because this program obviously is being sponsored by you. There's more than 52, as I mentioned prior to the broadcast, co-sponsors that were listed on the website tonight in addition to 120 spots that sold out in less than three weeks. Think about that, especially now where people don't have as much money to spend in certain places, we're able to sell out that quickly. Uh, we really hope for the April 8th event, we're gonna have just as equal great participation, uh, but I am excited and enthusiastic to be a part of these series. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As a proud Sacred Heart alumnus, good night and thank you and rest easy. Thank you for joining tonight's virtual beer tasting series of Brew a Shoe. Tonight was made possible by Nebco with additional support from Blind Rhino and Eli Cannons. To learn more about the Connecticut Brewers Guild African American Brewing Scholarship, visit sacredheart.edu forward slash black brewers. <laughs>